Oh, yeah. oh my goodness. All right. Well, um, I um, uh, I'm going to turn this over to Bob, who's the co-chair with Diane of the Immigration Task Force. Um, and then um, from Bob, uh, Stevie will introduce our guest facilitator tonight, who is Jessica. And, um, and Bob will give us a couple of pointers on some Zoom etiquette here. And Jessica and Stevie can chime in on anything that he doesn't cover that would help us make things easier for you, Jessica. We're, we're, um, we're sort of good at piloting, but we're novices for sure. So anything, just speak up if some, you need something the way you need. But Bob, I'm going to turn this over to you and I'll keep an eye on that waiting room for you. But this is all for you. So. Okay, thank you, Karen. Well, I want to say welcome to everybody. To see one workshop tonight. We're very excited. We've been planning this for quite a while and we hope it goes really well. Um, as Karen said, my name's Bob Wiss. I'm the co-chair of the Immigration Task Force along with uh, Diane Sprague right here. You know, these are really difficult times and um, I know how difficult it is for all of us. And so I just wanna say thank you for taking the time to spend 90 minutes with us on what we think is a really, really important subject. Something I hope will benefit you a great deal. Um, we will ask uh, that you mute yourself if you haven't already and uh, stay on mute until later on in the program when there'll be an opportunity to ask questions and have some discussion. And if I've forgotten any other etiquette rules, I'm sure my, the subsequent speakers will tell us. At that, I will turn it over to Stevie Hamill, who is going to introduce our speaker. Stevie? Yes, so I am extremely excited to announce that today we have Jessica Zimmerly with us um, for our Advocacy 101 training. She is the Program and Outreach Director at Earth Ministry, and she's been with Earth Ministry since 2013 and been the Program and Outreach Director since 2017. Um, and part of her work is, is this, um, organizing religious communities around advocacy campaigns on everything from climate change to fossil fuel, chemical safety, salmon recovery, and more. Um, she also serves as the lead program staff for Washington Interfaith Power and Light. Um, if you all keep up with the Earth Ministry newsletter letters, you know a little bit about that uh, merging, which you should, by the way, sign up for the Earth Ministry <laughs> newsletter. It's great. Um, and she is also a candidate for ordination as a deaconess in the Lutheran Church, specifically the ECLA. Um, but most excitingly for me, uh, she's one of my classmates at seminary at Seattle U. So I have so enjoyed being being um, in conversation with her. She's so thoughtful, so wonderful, and I'm really excited that she's here to talk to us tonight um, about advocacy. So with that, Jessica, I'll turn it over to you. Thanks for being here. Wonderful. Thank you for that kind intro, Stevie and, and Bob and uh, Karen as well. It is good to virtually gather tonight on this dreary evening uh, to learn about advocacy together. Um, like has already been stated, I really appreciate you taking the time um, to look at advocacy uh, from a lens of faith um, and a way that we can um, create systemic change in our world. So we're going to talk all about that. Um, but before we do, um, just some introductory pieces. So uh, Earth Ministry has uh, been really leading into a practice of a land acknowledgement. So I want to begin uh, by saying that where I am coming to you from uh, in North Seattle is the land of the Duwamish people and that they are very much here and present, bringing their ancient heritage to life. Um, and we're the first stewards of this land and continue to steward it today. And I want to do my first screen share with you all to just uh, share a resource in case this hasn't come across your path yet uh, that I think, seeing a map? Mods, okay, great. So, this is an, a map of traditional uh, indigenous territories um, all over the world. And you'll um, notice there's a lot of overlap of um, the colors here. And that's because this idea of um, 
firm boundaries is a, a relatively new colonial concept. So what I'm gonna do here on the left is zoom in on the address of your church, of Fauntleroy. And it looks like my network is being so slow. This is not ideal timing. Okay, well, it's not showing on the map right now, but what is showing here on the left-hand side, as it's slowly loading, is the nations on, on whose land uh, your church is located. So the Coast Salish, Duwamish, and Suquamish uh, tribes are all uh, historically uh, from this region. And you can click through on these links and go visit uh, websites associated with the tribes. Um, so it's, um, an important way to just start to be acquainted with uh, Native neighbors. Uh, this is something that's been asked of white allies, specifically um, doing a land acknowledgement as a ritual is not a way of co-opting um, indigenous ritual. It's really um, a sign of allyship and acknowledgement of uh, communities that have been erased for a really long time. So. I am going to stop share now, but I will put that link in our chat. And, oh, maybe, I don't see a chat here. I'll send it to, to you all um, as a follow-up to the event. It can go out to the registrant list. Okay, so thank you for taking that time to acknowledge our land. Um, I thought I would share a little bit about Earth Ministry, though, um, Perhaps some of you are familiar with our organization since our executive director, Leanne Barris, is a member of Fauntleroy. Uh, but can I just see a show of hands if you are familiar with Earth Ministry as an organization? And it's okay if not. Okay. Uh, wonderful. So um, lots of familiarity here. I'll just give a basic overview. We are a statewide nonprofit working specifically in the intersection of faith and environment. And we do that in a variety of ways, um, offering a variety of programs. So we uh, try to help people connect the dots between their faith and care for creation. We call that faith formation and taking the time to sit with our uh, different religious traditions um, and see why as people of faith we're called to care for earth and then what do we do about it so uh, you all are a greening congregation living into a commitment to care for and steward uh, your space and be active environmental um, stewards in the community and um, we have a network of congregations we support all across the state uh, and one of the other programs that we uh, offer and encourage is our faithful advocacy work. So um, this is where we're going to dive deep in today, but I just want to share kind of the broad picture of um, earth ministry in that these three different areas of faith formation, congregational life, and advocacy. Often we talk about them as a three-legged stool. So of course you need all three. Um, any other things I want to touch on? I will say our mission statement, which is recently updated, is to transform faith into action for the well-being of communities and the environment. So you'll notice uh, two main components there. First is faith in action. So we're really about um, bringing our values out into the world and sharing them uh, with one another and the broader community. And the second piece of that mission <laughs> is um, working together for the health of both human communities and the environment um, and having a deep um, grounding in environmental justice, uh, which ties both of those together. Okay, um, so that's a bit about Earth Ministry and the context from which I'm coming to you. That said, I know that this is hosted by your Immigration Task Force. So what we're gonna talk about tonight is more broad and applicable to any issue that you are passionate about. Um, we're gonna be looking at the framework for advocacy and then you can overlay it with your specific issue. Though I may use some examples uh, from our environmental world uh, from which I, I come to you. Any questions about Earth Ministry before we dive into advocacy? 
I will add, um, if you haven't yet, check out our new strategic plan. It's um, a really um, amazing vision that we are living into and uh, released <clears throat> early this year, spring, which feels like many years ago at this point. But um, within it, we have committed to becoming a fully multi-faith organization, which is a very exciting uh, official transformation for the organization. So I do invite you to take a look at, at what we're up to and what our vision for the next five years is. <clears throat> okay. Um, is there um, a chance? So I'm not seeing a chat and I was gonna just ask for some participation in chat. Is there a, a way we can turn on chat or do others see a chat option? Karen or Stevie? I don't see it either. Odd, oddly, I mean, it's always here. But yeah. I don't. I don't know why it's not on the screen. If somebody has a clue about leading me where to uh, kind of check on that, that's okay. I just wanted to make sure it wasn't just me. So if it's, we can we can do without just fine. Um, so then, here's what we're, here's what I would like to do um, with this topic of advocacy. I invite you to share kind of what your entry point is, um, what your, your comfort level or um, awareness of what advocacy is all about uh, might be. And I invite you to do that um, by doing a thumbs up, a thumbs sideways or a thumbs down. And there's no wrong answer. It's just to kind of get a, a gauge on uh, where we're entering into this conversation from. So a thumbs up would be like, yeah, I've advocated, I've gone and talked to my elected officials and I write and sign petitions and et cetera. Um, a, a thumbs down is like, I think I have an idea what this is and I've done a little, but I'm not so sure. And a thumbs down is like, what are we talking about? What is advocacy? Okay, so can we see your thumbs? Okay, I see some th sideways and ups. And I don't think I see any fold downs. So that's awesome, um, which makes sense to me because I know Fauntleroy is really um, an active uh, community working for social justice. So that is great. Um, and um, also just to hear a little bit about what brings you here tonight. So this is what I was gonna ask folks to write in chat. So um, instead, I am going to invite just a few folks um, to chime in and briefly share what it is that brought you here tonight, um, what your hope is for this time together and this dialogue around advocacy. So maybe just, I don't know, about three folks uh, who want to share briefly. Um, I invite you to raise a hand and unmute yourself. Yeah, Sarah. I would say that I'm familiar with being an advocate for myself, um, you know, in, in doing outreach. I'm not as familiar about what we're doing as a faith community in terms of advocacy. So that's sort of my frame of coming tonight. Thank you, that's helpful. Anyone else? Stevie, yeah. Hello. Yeah, I think I uh, shared that resonance with Sarah. I, you know, we've done a letter writing campaign as a church before, um, but most of our advocacy is sort of individual in our household. So I'm excited to learn how um, and think about together how we can do advocacy as a, as a body of faith. One or two more, anyone else? Yeah, is it, is it Pamela? I, I just would say that my first advocacy um, was actually at the state capitol in Olympia, Washington. Um, I'm a grandma from Connecticut with a grandchild that I, um, that I grandchild that I'm a grandmother to, um, and I was with uh, a, a Girl Scout troop, and um, 
saw the way in which together we could do a lot more in a one day kind of thing at the state house and went home to Connecticut and started doing state house days for um, advocacy in my profession, which is physical therapy and specifically with children with disabilities and families in terms of their ability to, um, to know the networks with whom they could be in touch when they needed things. Mm -hmm. And so um, that led me to being a networking person in a lot of different areas. And um, environment is one that I'm not, I've not done a lot with, but um, health, um, wellness, um, el elderly, um, ability to stay in homes, um, mm -hmm. things that were related to my profession. But recently I've been with immigration in terms of um, now moving more to advocacy because we were doing, we were putting up, putting things in houses and making sure that we had that. So I'm really here because I, I love the fact that um, you all are doing something across interfaith, which I am in an interfaith group as well and decided I got to see how the West Coast does it. So thank you for letting me in. <laughs> Yeah, good to have you. And I'm, I'm glad you're bringing experience and that you've shared that before. And hopefully we'll pick Don't up some know everything. We never know all the answers. We need sure. networks. We need networks. Amen. And now some of you might be mine. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Okay, unless anyone's itching to share here, I'm going to move us along. But I'll pause. Anyone else? Okay, so um, that is um, helpful to hear about kind of thinking about acting together as a church, um, especially as um, an interest of, of at least two of you. Um, I uh, will just give you a bit of a lay of the land, or not a lay of the land, excuse me, a roadmap is what I wanted to say, of um, where I'm thinking that we will go this evening. Um, and then we will, um, start down that road. So first I am planning to just provide a basic overview of what advocacy is and what it is specifically um, through a faith-based approach. Um, then we'll get more into, well, what does that actually look like? So um, some broad, um, a broad overview of kind of our governmental process and um, the different uh, methods through which we can be advocates and um, how we can do that through church. And then uh, the last section will be um, getting a bit more detailed with some tips for effective testimony um, as you go out into the world as faithful advocates. Um, I'll be pausing for some questions and feedback throughout, um, but there hopefully I, I hope to hold enough time at the end uh, for a, a short Q&A as well. Um, but if there's something that, you know, you want um, me to go into more detail about, um, please do chime in because ultimately this time is for you and I want you to get as much as you can out of it. So with that, I am going to um, attempt to share my screen again and hopefully it responds a little bit better. <laughs> um, just one second here. Okay. I think my poor laptop needs a nap. Probably like Stevie and I, we're both at the end of our quarter <laughs> for school. Um, come on. Okay, I think we've got it loading and now. Hmm, okay. Yep. yep. Yes, wonderful. Here we are, let's go. Um, so to begin, what is advocacy? Um, from a, a secular lens, um, 
I uh, defined advocacy as speaking up to influence decisions within our political, economic, and social institutions. And um, it's really looking towards systemic change. So addressing root causes of issues um, through public policy, through new policy or um, uh, reformed policy. Um, and so it's different than um, charity, which would be um, more of addressing a direct need. This is getting a bit deeper into what um, is behind that need. And really advocacy is a way for us to actively participate in democracy. It can happen all year round, uh, not just with your uh, big elections as we recently um, participated in. Um, my um, uh, dear mentor, Jesse Dye, who many of you may know, um, like to say that uh, democracy is like exercise. You can't just do it every four years and call it good. So we want to practice our democracy year round um, and find various ways to uh, share our values in the public sphere. So then faithful advocacy uh, specifically is approaching uh, this work for systemic justice uh, from our uh, faith traditions and bringing in those religious values that are so central to who we are as people of faith. So um, it could be thought of as a following in Christ's footsteps. Um, I like to think of uh, Jesus as a, a bit of a radical advocate himself in calling out systems that were broken, um, in standing with those on the margins, in really working towards a society built on love, um, and uh, asking us to join him in that work of ultimately co-creating a, a kingdom, um, uh, a society that really um, reflects that uh, justice and love for all. And just like it's putting democracy in action, um, faithful advocacy is putting your faith into action. So I um, really don't think of it as um, secondary, but rather central to faith, uh, to be speaking out uh, within our communities and within the systems in which we find ourselves to uh, bring these values to the table. So some attributes of faithful advocacy. Um, it is a values-based approach. So we're really working to hone in on what our values are. Uh, things like justice, uh, clean air, um, responsibility, uh, a better future for our kids and grandkids, um, really uh, naming those values that grow out of our faith tradition and sharing those as we advocate. So uh, compared to um, perhaps secular advocacy, which might show up a bit more uh, from the head, we want to show up from the heart. We wanna really show up first and foremost as people of faith uh, and share our stories and connect with decision makers through our values, which often overlap more than we might expect. Um, I want to talk a bit about justice and equity. So um, for Earth Ministry especially, um, justice and equity inform what we are advocating for. So all of our campaigns really have this uh, root value of environmental justice. And the equity component is lived out in that many of the policies that we're supporting are informed and led by the communities most impacted. So there's really an element of listening to those who are uh, feeling the impacts of climate change or toxic pollution or the struggles of immigration and uh, asking what does the solution look like for you and how can we work together to help craft that. And ultimately it's a hopeful approach um, when we come to advocacy through our faith. So um, we are stepping into this uh, somewhat divisive arena um, with the, the grace and the goodness of God. And um, I like to think of it a bit as the 
uh, um, I don't know, following the movement of the spirit in the world and in our uh, belief that ultimately the, the arc of the universe does bend towards justice. Um, and we have each a piece to play in that puzzle. Another um, attribute of faithful advocacy is its ability to build bridges. So, um, you know, like I said, it's a, a very divided time in which we are navigating um, different uh, administrations and uh, landscapes, uh, political landscapes. And so holding space for dialogue is really uh, a gift that the faith community can bring. Um, an example I'll share is that Earth Ministry is doing some work in Eastern Washington around salmon recovery, which is looking at a restoration of the Lower Snake River. And so that involves a, a conversation that can be a bit contentious around um, potentially uh, removing uh, the four Lower Snake River dams. And uh, Earth Ministry has been able to hold space for that really hard conversation uh, through a series of events we've called Loaves and Fishes that bring together different uh, members of uh, constituency groups that are impacted, um, especially native nations who are sovereign and uh, have treaty protected uh, rights to salmon, um, but also um, farmers and fishermen, um, all kind of moderated by a faith leader. So um, we can hold that space for the dialogue and we can help foster uh, and bring in our value of collaboration and working together on solutions that can benefit all impacted. And then finally, I want to touch on how it's um, supported by community. So um, when you advocate as a person of faith, um, it's like you have a cloud of witness with you. Um, I often joke that I think about it as that scene from Lord of the Rings when Aragorn shows up and has the ghost army coming in and saves the day. Um, and he nerds out there. You, you know what I'm talking about. Um, but that's because when you show up and you say, I'm a person of faith and I'm a member of Earth Ministry and I go to Fontenoy UCC in West Seattle, it paints a picture of uh, the broader community that is standing with you, um, that is sharing your same core values and um, likely uh, thinks similarly, though you're not speaking for them, you're not saying they think exactly the same as you do on a specific policy, but uh, you do gather at church around your shared values. Um, so when you're talking about things like uh, justice and stewardship, um, rights uh, for, for those who are immigrating into our country, et cetera, um, as something that your community has committed to, uh, that is something you can bring forward and know that you kind of have numbers at your back there. And then finally, it's sustaining um, to do this as part of a community, to be uh, a member of a movement of people that really do believe that there is another uh, path forward that is possible and are working together toward that vision um, versus kind of the opposite, which I suppose could be a, a lone ranger type of um, type of approach. Um, Earth Ministry does all of our advocacy in coalition spaces with secular nonprofits. So we are members of uh, multiple different coalitions um, that have uh, various different um, gifts therein. You know, they have um, different resources, different um, staff uh, skills. So, you know, they have the policy experts and the scientists and the economists, uh, but we show up within that space uh, specifically as people of faith. And that is what we bring is this values-based, heart-based approach within that overall um, coalition community. Okay, next slide. So um, just one more piece, and then I'm gonna pause to hear a little bit from you all of, um, you know, why be a faithful advocate? Does it matter? This is a question I get a lot as, oh, well, does it really make a difference? And the short answer is yes, 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 it certainly does. Your elected officials actually work for you. And in order for them to represent you, they need to hear from you um, and they need to know 
where you stand on different issues and, and what uh, values uh, you're bringing and what your experience has been. So when you bring your stories forward to your elected officials, um, that gives them a resource to then share with their colleagues. I remember it was uh, last winter now, we had a, a group gathering in Olympia and one of the state uh, representatives attended and she said, please tell me your stories because I take those out onto the floor when these bills come up for a vote and share them. And that's what ultimately moves uh, her fellow representatives um, to think about changing their vote um, or supporting something more strongly than they might have otherwise is the stories more so than the numbers and facts and all of that. It's the stories that keep you up at night, right? And that stick with you. And speaking about changing hearts and minds, a fun fact that I love sharing is it only takes seven points of contact uh, to move an elected official up or down a notch. So that means seven phone calls, seven letters um, is enough for somebody who was totally unaware of something to say, oh, I should take a look at that bill and I should learn more. Um, somebody who was like, no, nah, no, it's, they might reconsider. Somebody who um, was, told, uh, was already going to vote yes, might then take a step further to become a champion for that bill. So it's uh, some in context are, you know, not enough to go straight from a no to a yes, but along those uh, kind of stages of development in between. Um, and, it, and like I said, if, uh, so I, another question I often hear is, uh, well, I think my elected officials are going to vote the way that I want them to. So why they don't need to hear from me, they're already gonna vote yes on this. They do still need to hear from you. Again, uh, because it um, can confirm what they might perceive, um, it can confirm um, that their constituency has their support. And then also it could be enough um, to really encourage them to be a champion. So there's folks that vote yes, and you're like, okay, that's good. But what we really need is champions uh, who are willing to have those hard conversations and take things across the aisle and try to bring others along uh, because they know that they have really strong constituent support. Um, a few other points. Um, so we, of course, we need um, the policy experts and the, the lobbyists are uh, all over these spaces. Um, but what we really need is uh, a moral anchor, right? Um, for real people to come in and share why real people care. Um, and that can really humanize the whole process of um, something moving um, through a, a political, yeah, um, through the many hoops of political processes. Um, I wanted to note that, um, that advocacy can complement what you're doing as an individual. So it's um, a both and that we encourage you to both do what you can as a person um, to, um, to support the issue that you are passionate about. So for environment, you know, I'm going to do my best to limit my carbon footprint, to be mindful of the chemicals that I am or am not using, um, to um, think about what's going into our sound for our orcas and salmon. And I can do what I can, but ultimately my actions can be um, again, amplified um, through policy uh, work. Um, so um, I don't want to minimize your individual actions. Those are still important. And we also need to take it into the, the broader arena so that um, it can be a more uh, integrated part of our whole society. And then finally, why be a faithful advocate? Again, because it's really central to an active faith life um, and to um, showing love for your neighbor, um, love for creation, um, and working to, again, build that uh, kingdom that our, uh, our Christian Bible um, shares in the gospel.
Okay, so I'm going to pause here and stop my share. Hopefully I'll be able to start it again. And hello. Okay, so I uh, would love to just hear um, a little bit from, again, you know, two or three folks about um, what stands out to you so far uh, in this conversation around uh, advocacy from a faith-based approach. I think we've got, uh, is it Denny? Okay. Yeah. To unmute? Okay, and then we'll- I, I would just second what you say, what you're saying. I have done um, advocacy down in um, Olympia through the Faithful Action Network. Mm -hmm. And it is so, it's just so inspiring when a group gets together and does that and then goes to talk to, uh, especially a local legislator. I, it's, uh, they really listen, it's wonderful. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Right. Feels really good. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And then you have something to build on when you uh, call or write. So yeah, it's good stuff. Mm -hmm. I, I guess I have a question, Karen, how, how much of, or anybody, how much of this kind of thing have we done as a congregation or as um, like immigration uh, group or whatever? Any of that at all? Is, have we done it all? I'm still sort of new, so I, I don't know exactly what happens. In the time that I've been here, it's been more around um, letter writing campaigns um, and, uh, and calling legislators. And then I know some people have been involved in calls to like city council to advocate for different issues um, when they're just hearing a whole queue of people, but just to make sure that voice is there from the church. Um, and those are the best examples I can personally let us talk about from the church from the time I've been here. I don't know if there were was a more active advocacy work done um, before I came. I, I think that's I think that spells it out but you know the other thing is that the reason we're having the workshop is really to kick around what we can do in the future and mm -hmm. we're comfortable doing in the future. And Rob, I saw your hand. In further answer to Denny's question, I think the efforts have been kind of inconsistent and probably modest over 35 years. Mm -hmm. um, and and I'll, uh, I don't want to take up too much time, but I just want to echo, Jessica, you brought up, um, a, you helped me remember I'd gone to D.C. to do some advocacy for um, such uh, comprehensive sexuality education. And um, when we met with our senators from Washington, that's all they kept telling us was, we, we hear from the, we hear the negative side and you, you, you are the ballast that helps remind us. Mm -hmm. And those, they say, we know you're probably coming here thinking um, you've heard, you know, we're kind of where you are because we knew what their, their, um, their stance was their progressive stance was already, but um, but they said, and, and when we hear from you, it amplifies, it reminds us, and it keeps that narrative from getting skewed one way or another. And that has really stuck with me so that when I feel there's an outreach I need to do that complements something that's been done or lifts up something, even though I know it'll be acknowledged, um, I, I'm much better now about reaching out rather than just those things I disagree with. And the last thing I'll say is my daughter was with me on that trip. And they turned to her for her story about how her church was doing that because she was involved in an OWL program, a, a comprehensive sexuality class in our, in our church. And it was her story that they took as they went to advocate or one of her stories because she, because she was a youth and that was um, compelling to them. So thank you for bringing those up. Uh, it was good to remember that. Yeah, thank you, Karen. I'm so glad that you had that experience um, and, and shared it with us. And I, I want to add one thing, too. So you said, um, you know, sharing what you support. And also, it's so important to, to show up and thank our elected leaders when they do um, 
show the, the leadership that we are asking for. Um, I think so often we're on to the next thing, right? Um, but showing that gratitude um, also is a really important and can help solidify relationship there. Um, I think I saw a hand from Maria. And then um, Jan and it says Office Max Soto. So that's our, our cue there. Okay, Maria. I just wanted to add the question to the question about what the church has done. This is not exactly advocacy, but it it's, brings up an interesting question that I have in my mind is, is how does protest um, support advocacy? And the example, not just the um, more general marches, but specifically a group from our church joined many, many other people um, showing up for a specific individual in the um, South King County ICE office as he was going through his um, deportation mm -hmm. hearing. And there were a lot of um, people there making, um, you know, their presence known in support of this um, individual. And um, I think that got a, a fair amount of media coverage. And so my mm -hmm. other question is about where does protest intersect with advocacy, especially if that's a way to get more attention on the topic. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's such a great point. Um, um, protest is, um, you know, under the broad umbrella of advocacy, it might not be under the, the traditional, um, so to say, of talking directly with a decision maker, but the points that you raise around media attention, around uh, showing a widespread public concern, um, those really do make a difference. Um, and showing where the overall community um, is on, a, on an issue. So um, I believe protest is a great form of advocacy um, and um, is... Um, uh, also a, a wonderful um, launch pad around a story that you can share directly with an elected official later on of saying, hey, I went to this protest for this um, person who was held at ICE. It was, there were so many folks there with me and we really care a lot about this, right? Um, so when we get a bit later to talking about how we craft um, our messaging to elected officials um, using protest, um, as a, a good story to build around is a helpful tool. Okay, a couple more. We had, uh, is it Jan? Yeah, it's Jan Campbell. Hi. Yeah, I guess uh, one of the questions I have is like the Immigration Task Force is working on um, creating an asylum uh, home for people, for immigrants. Uh, now, I consider that advocacy, actually doing things, providing food for the homeless and that. Is that under your umbrella or do you see that as separate? And then my second question is, mm -hmm. I think it's always challenging whenever we do advocacy to not cross the line. And I'm not even sure where the line is uh, of, of going into politics and you know, getting more into the political arena. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, good questions. So um, I would I would say um, in terms of um, your first question um, that I wouldn't quite call um, you know housing folks and and um, doing kind of hands on services. Uh, I would not put that under my advocacy umbrella. I would say that that is a form of direct service. It's responding to the overall issue that needs to be addressed. It's helping to alleviate it, um, but it's, it's um, uh, advocacy would take it to that next step of looking at the roots of why, why is it that the church is having to do this? Why isn't this something that is uh, part of our social services in our city or county? Um, and so, uh, advocacy is then um, again taking that experience and sharing it with the the people who are in positions of power to um, change those systems. So hopefully, um, we don't have to do so much of that ourselves, but it can be more built in with the society in which we find ourselves. Does that make sense? Yeah, but I'm not sure that I'd hate. I'd... 
me providing those services direct like that, it's mm -hmm. fun and it's yeah. really rewarding. So right. I'm happy to see that go. Right. So this is getting back to um, one of my points was, was how it can complement our individual actions. So it's a, an, a both and. We need to do both those acts of love and service to our neighbor and uh, can speak up uh, in the halls of power um, on their behalf and, and alongside them. Um, so certainly not saying uh, one is better than the other. It's um, and each of us have our call to uh, be um, uh, to share our gifts in different ways. Um, so advocacy isn't isn't quite for everybody. That's OK. Um, and, and part of approaching this through faith is believing that ultimately God is at work through all of us. And so we have the, the different gifts and the different tools to approach this um, with uh, the diversity of our expressions of, of faith. Um, in terms of your second question around politics, um, we're going to get there um, in, in just a couple uh, slides. I'm going to go back to my slideshow um, about um, what, how churches can engage in the political process. And um, really advocacy is politics. We can participate in the political process in politics um, in a way that is uh, rooted in faith and values, um, is not partisan, um, but is uh, rather looking at how we can um, bring those values into the conversation and um, support specific policies, not people, policies that um, reflect the values that we share. So we'll, we'll go more into that um, because I know it's a, a common um, overarching uh, question here. Okay, and um, last, let's hear from uh, Office Max. <laughs> it's Mary, sorry. Hi, Mary. I don't know how to fix that. Um, you know, I, I realize one of the reasons I struggle to do advocacy is I think I have this impression that politicians meet with us common folk for PR reasons, hmm. not because they're really that interested in what we have to say. So um, I need to get over that, I think, to be a very active participant. And I don't know if you can speak to that or if, or if mm -hmm. you found the more you did it, the more it, you felt it was a genuine. I mean, I've had a little, I have had in jobs where I've had interaction, it always felt very superficial to me. So, um, so I don't know how to get past that feeling. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> uh, thank you for sharing that, Mary. Um, yeah, I'm thinking back to when I, I first started um, advocating when I came to Earth Ministry and thinking like, do they really, do they really want to hear from me? Like I was 22 at the time, you know, what do I know? Um, and oh, maybe they just want to, have a photo with a young person to, to put on their website, right? So I, I hear that. Um, but through my experience over the past seven years, um, I've come to see that really um, it does matter. The folks that elected officials are seeing on a daily basis are the folks in suits who are paid to show up there, right? The lobbyists of the big um, powers with money um, are the ones that... Um, are often filling the halls of uh, our decision makers. And so um, to counterweight that, um, they really do need to hear from real people. And you know, oftentimes um, I'll be at the Capitol and um, we'll come down and we'll have a group of folks from all different legislative districts and we'll go door to door and uh, just drop off our um, uh, handout with the bills we're supporting with each office, right? And if we come to the office that a member of the group is an actual constituent of, there are like multiple times where that legislator will like drop what they're doing and be like, what? You're a constituent? You came here from Olympia or, or from Whidbey Island or Bellingham. You went all the way to Olympia from your home to be here. This matters to you. I want to hear from you. Let's talk. I'll make a little bit of space in my very busy schedule. Um, so, um, yes, there is constituent power. Um, and in terms of PR, there might be some of that too, but, you know, rather see them with us than with the suits. And, uh, usually it's actually me. I'm always trying to get photos for earth ministry. So usually it's me at the end. That's like, wait, can we get a photo please? Um, so that we can, um, share within our network. So, 
uh, for what it's worth. Yep. Okay, let's continue on our uh, journey here then to, to look a bit more into what advocacy looks like um, more specifically. So let's uh, shoot up a prayer that my PowerPoint will restart. It will, we're gonna manifest it. Here we are. Okay, and we'll go to our next slide here. So this is just a brief overview of um, the basic structure of the United States government. Um, so we don't have to get you know into the, the wonky weeds here, but just a reminder around our three different branches of government and then the different levels uh, in which they operate. So um, our legislative branch um, is um, what is comprised of Congress, our state legislature, so that's who gather in Olympia here in Washington, and then locally it's our city council or county council, et cetera. And their job is to create and pass laws and ordinances, um, budgets, uh, regulations, et cetera. So they make the laws and pass them. And then it moves to the executive branch, which uh, has the role of carrying out those laws. So this is our um, president, governor, mayor, county executive, et cetera. And uh, also all of the agencies that work for them. So uh, using the example of the environmental field, um, on a federal level, it would be the EPA, the Environmental Protection Agency. Then state, we have the Department of Ecology. And locally here in Seattle, we have the Office of Sustainability and the Environment. And they're the ones really implementing these laws. So when we pass a bill in the legislature, um, they then go through uh, this process with the uh, administrative uh, side of things. Um, Earth Ministry is currently doing a work around that um, with uh, some of our work on toxic chemical reform. So we passed a really great bill. It said, hey, we need to look at these five different classes of chemicals in consumer products. And now over the last year, we've been working with the Department of Health and Department of Ecology in uh, providing feedback about what products matter to us as consumers. Um, and they have actually expanded the product areas in response to that feedback. So that's a, a, a great victory to share. And then finally, our third branch is the judicial. So these are our courts. Uh, they interpret and uphold the laws. Um, and we uh, don't influence them as directly. They're you know, meant to be more uh, impartial, um, but we do um, cast our vote for um, filling the courts um, and do our, our service uh, on juries and whatnot. Okay, so then let's turn to what this looks like at church, um, which we've heard a, a few questions about tonight. So uh, a church uh, follows the same legal uh, restrictions as a uh, nonprofit. Uh, so as Earth Ministry, as a what we're called a 501c3 nonprofit, and this um, delineates what we can and cannot do in terms of engaging in politics. There are nonprofits, I should say, that can engage. They're called uh, C4, 501C4 nonprofits, um, can do this stuff, but that's not us in church world. So we'll just set that aside. So what we cannot do is uh, particularly partisan politics. That's the big no. So that means endorsing candidates, getting really specific about people, um, encouraging other people to vote for a particular candidate or uh, campaigning again for candidates with church time or resources. So like if you're on staff and you have an email that's uh, at fontleroyucc.org, uh, can't use that to send out emails saying vote for so-and-so. But there's a lot that we still can do as nonprofits in terms of uh, uh, advocacy. So we can indeed take a position on a specific issue, bill, or ballot measure. So for example, this um, last election cycle this month, Earth Ministry endorsed Seattle City Proposition 1, which is uh, looking at funding our uh, metro and transportation, public transit, 
it passed, hooray. Um, but we were able to take a public stance and say, yes, we endorse this. And we encourage our members, uh, those in the Earth Ministry Network to also support uh, the, this proposition. So that gets into educating others, asking them um, to um, support or uh, oppose um, the issue bill or ballot measure that you are um, speaking up on. We can also get specific in asking our elected officials to vote a certain way on a bill. So this is what it often looks like in Olympia. We're showing up, we're saying, hey, we wanna draw your attention to House Bill 1540. And we really think it's important that you vote yes on this and here's why. So we can get that specific. Um, we can also get specific with our agencies. So this is in our uh, conversations with Department of Health or Ecology um, in uh, what we would like to see in these um, regulations that they are ironing out. We can do nonpartisan voter engagement. So that's um, things like uh, what we saw a lot of this fall, uh, get out the vote messaging. Uh, so encouraging people to just get their ballots in. Um, we can tell people to vote their values. Um, so uh, that is a way that the, the church can specifically um, say, we won't tell you who to vote for, but we will tell you to vote your values, vote for people who reflect your values and you can discern who that is. Jesse, can I ask a question about that? So then yeah. like, for example, with Vote Forward mm -hmm. as an organization, can, can we have people participate in Vote Forward without violating our nonprofit status? Yes, so um, you can. So Vote Forward, if you're um, not familiar with them, um, I actually volunteered with them this fall myself personally. Um, they are coordinating people sending letters to um, folks in uh, districts that are um, um, less likely to turn out to vote um, or potentially underrepresented communities. Um, I actually know um, the Kavanaugh Cooperative, uh, which is a Jewish community in Queen Anne, um, did a weekly vote forward night where folks came together and wrote these letters. Um, mm -hmm. So as long as within it, you're staying nonpartisan, so you're not writing to them and saying vote for fill in the blank. You're just saying, hey, and actually how they frame those letters, they say, I vote in every election because I believe democracy works better with all of us. I hope you'll join me in casting your, your ballot this coming runoff election, et cetera. Mm -hmm. Okay, the last one I'll touch on is a candidate forum. So this is when, um, is this, this has some more parameters around it, which is that you can only do this if you invite all candidates and if all of the candidates are treated impartially and, and equally. Um, so say um, your district has a, a seat open um, for your state rep, you could invite the different people who are running for that seat. You have to make sure all of them are invited uh, and it's their choice whether or not they attend, but those invitations have to be like on the record and, and clearly out there. Okay, so that's uh, a bit of what church engagement in advocacy looks like. Um, you know, I heard interest in uh, folks asking like, oh, well, how could we do this as a community? Um, and um, I've heard that you've done some letter writing. I really uh, want to um, say that's important. Um, it's not something to diminish. Um, sometimes it's like, oh, we just wrote letters and that doesn't feel as flashy or fun. Um, but really, uh, again, those are a point of contact and seven letters is enough to make a difference, right? Um, I think you can also, um, you know, in the before times, um, I would take folks down to Olympia during our state legislative session um, to meet directly with their elected officials. So it was like different uh, representatives from various churches all in the same district would come down together, which shows a nice uh, ecumenical or interfaith presence in support of a topic. Um, you can also do, you know, sign on letters, um, um, 
similar to letter writing. Um, and yeah, I I think we'll 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 get kind of more into individual uh, advocacy options here next, and you can think through how these could translate into Fauntleroy's context um, and uh, kind of organized within the community setting more than um, an individual. So we can get creative with that, but let's look at it first. So, okay, this is um, kind of the spread of what uh, individual advocacy action looks like. So, um, most basically, you're meeting with your elected officials uh, within those uh, legislative or executive branch um, to build relationships and to share your concerns and to ask for their leadership uh, and support. Um, you can do that individually. Um, you can do that collectively. Uh, often there's um, lobby days. So someone mentioned going down for interfaith advocacy day. Um, I'm always there teaching the environmental workshop um, uh, and that's um, in partnership with the Faith Action Network. Um, so they are coordinating the visits for you. Um, you can also reach out to organizations like Earth Ministry and, and I'll coordinate a, a visit if the logistics of it is kind of what is keeping you away. We're happy to help with that. Uh, but these meetings, um, I'll say that they are often very short. Um, so it's just a chance to share a snippet of your story. You don't have to have all of the answers and don't have to be a policy expert, which is really a gift of approaching this through faith. Because again, you're there to uh, bring your heart into the conversation. Um, sometimes these meetings will end up being with staff and folks tend to be a bit disappointed. Like, oh, I wanted to meet with the Senator themselves. Why am I meeting with their aide? their aid actually holds a lot of influence and power. So those meetings are just as important and um, uh, meaningful um, because it's often the aid that controls what gets to the legislator's desk. And they're the one kind of keeping a tally of what comes into their email inbox and what issues people are particularly uh, concerned about. So don't diminish meeting with the aides. Other forms of advocacy can be uh, written communication. So either by email or, or um, through snail mail, um, sending postcards has been, I think, a, a trending activity here, um, though it does take longer. So if it's a timely issue, uh, email is the quickest. Um, here in Washington, we have a really amazing resource called the Legislative Hotline. So this is a phone number that's open during the week, once the legislature is in session, starting from January this year through April. And it's just a operator on the other end who takes down uh, a note for your uh, representatives and senator and passes that along. So it's a chance for you to, to make, you know, a three minute phone call and just say, hey, please support a clean fuel standard. We really need to address uh, the uh, emissions in our transportation sector because our, our children and our planet deserve a habitable future. And PS, I'm from Fauntleroy UCC and we care a lot about this. There you go. Um, so that is a really uh, convenient tool uh, for legislative action on the state level. I also mentioned a literature drop. Um, so that again is when we go office to office and say, hello, we're here with the faith community and earth ministry and this is what we care about and are supporting this session. And we ask for the Senator's support as well. And sometimes we get to talk to them uh, directly, especially if there's a constituent. Um, other times we leave materials with the aid, but it's uh, really making your presence known um, because as you're going through the hallways, they hear you saying your your bit over and over again um and and um that matters okay um then we get kind of into public hearings and comment periods so public hearings can look like um a more uh, administrative process so in the environmental world any new projects have to go undergo environmental review. And as part of that, there is uh, opportunities for public comment in um, providing feedback on draft versions of the environmental impact statement, 
um, the scope of, of what should be included in that. So there's um, opportunities um, in that administrative process. And then also in the legislative process, every bill has to move through multiple committees in order to make it to the floor for a vote. So the, the photo here in this slide is of a uh, committee hearing at the state legislature. Um, this must have been a, a big bill because um, it's a rather full room. Um, it's not always such, um, but uh, there are opportunities to uh, speak for two minutes. And usually those are, um, you know, you prepare a bit, you can write out what you're going to say and read off of that. Um, and um, uh, that really, again, we're encouraging them to be story-based. Uh, if speaking in front of a crowd is not for you, attending public hearings, awesome. That also, similarly to the question earlier around protests, right, it shows uh, broad support. Um, often uh, in our work on halting fossil fuel facilities, we told folks to all wear the color red and just show up. And so you would see the sea of red. Um, I think it was in one of our earlier photos here on the slides. Um, but seeing that sea of red, telling the folks, um, the decision makers there from the agency that, wow, this crowd is like 90% opposed to this project. Huh, that means something. <laughs> um, oops. Okay. Um, you can also submit written comments. So written comments are taken, um, they say are taken just as seriously as um, verbal comments. I think the benefit of doing something orally is that other folks get to hear you and that can also uh, influence and move them. Um, but um, you can always submit comments in writing. Uh, and then uh, town halls are uh, events that elected officials will hold to hear from their constituents. And so those are uh, spaces where you can speak up and bring an issue forward that really matters to you and be sure that they um, have it on their radar. Jessica. Okay, I'm gonna uh, again stop uh, share here for a little bit of, um, to see if there's any questions. Yeah. Uh, who's, am I going? Okay. Yeah, Rob. Yeah. Two things. Um, as a former suit for the Washington State Hospital Association, um, I'd like to offer that, well, I, I have a point to make and, a, and um, just a reinforcement. Uh, the first is that numbers count. So you said mm -hmm. sometimes seven contacts is enough, but a hundred is a lot more important. And mm -hmm. one of the things that those legislative aides are doing is keeping track of the numbers of emails or numbers of letters or telephone calls so when you have an alliance of several churches working on an issue and you can multiply seven times seven times seven, then you've really got some momentum. Mm -hmm. um, the second thing is on the list of activities that you just went through, I think you omitted one that would be important. And that is when the legislature is not in session, make it a point to go meet with a legislator, get mm -hmm. to know them on a personal basis Right. Um, Eileen Cody has been a legislator in this district for, I don't know, 25 or 30 years. And um, she holds forth at the CMP coffee shop once or twice a week. Um, you just have to call and talk to her aide and get an appointment. And you can have 10 or 15 minutes to talk to her uh, if you have a cause or if you don't have a cause, uh, mm -hmm. uh, just to have a, a few minutes so she knows who you are. And, and mm -hmm. uh, I think that's a great benefit of that. Um, mm -hmm. And if I could go on for a moment um, and volunteering activities for the Crohn's and Colitis Foundation uh, a couple summers ago, we had a bill that was kind of stalled out because it was a little bit confusing, I guess. Um, and so I knew her, so I called her, bought her a cup of coffee or, or shared the time with coffee and pointed out the specifics of the legislation that the Crohn's and Colitis Foundation wanted to have passed. And she took that, made it a better bill and got it past the next legislative session. Yeah, thank you, Rob. Um, I'm so grateful to hear of your experience. And you know, not all suits are um, 
on the the opposite side of, of which we find ourselves some you know uh, nonprofits and, and important foundations and um, community um, partners um, also have lobbyists um, so I hope you didn't feel villainized to there um, but I, I appreciate you making the point about um, just getting to know your elected officials building those relationships, in the seasons where they're less busy, when they're not running between meeting and meeting and committee hearing and uh, having to get to the floor, et cetera, which is the, the hectic uh, way it goes in Olympia. Um, so that's a, a really excellent point. Um, and that they remember and carry things forward. Yes, thank you. Yeah, Stevie. Yeah, I have two questions. Um, my first is, is it worth it when we're writing letters or making phone calls um, to continue to do that like multiple days in a row? Or is it more just like that constituents called once, that's a number and we're not gonna count it multiple times. How does that work? Is it good to pester, I guess, is the question. <laughs> yeah, I think um, if it's the same issue that you're calling on, probably uh, avoid the, the pestering. Um, you know, you can um, follow an issue as it progresses, right? So if mm -hmm. uh, you're supporting an issue and it's in that um, uh, committee that, that, that your legislator sits on that committee and it passes out of that committee, you can follow up and say, thank you. I really hope that you help garner votes for this on the floor when it makes it there. Um, so, you know, you can follow along um, and show that you're paying attention to this, this uh, legislation, um, which also shows you're really invested in it. Um, but if it's just kind of like re repeated, like, hey, do this, hey, do this, hey, do this, um, around the same this, um, I probably wouldn't suggest it. I, I do often, though, um, you know, so Earth Ministry will support a slate of bills and people say, well, I wanna write about this bill, but then I also wanna write about this bill. Um, I would say um, go for it in breaking those out and doing multiple notes um, because if, if each one is on a separate topic, um, that will help that topic stand out more than if it's uh, you know, buried within a laundry list of seven things you want them to do. So, you know, maybe put a, a day or two in between or do it when it, seems strategic for that, uh, that bill's motion. Um, so yeah, good that's question. helpful. Cause I know at least on some of the social media, um, things I follow, they'll say call every day. And I'm like, I don't know how helpful that is. So thank you, Jessica. And then I guess the second part is, um, my second question is how, what have been the reactions have you seen, or what's the, uh, benefit of specifically naming ourselves as people of faith when we go to council meetings in our letters, mm -hmm. in our phone calls, et cetera. Yeah. Oh, I'm so, so grateful that you asked this. So there's um, significant um, depth that is added when you show up unapologetically as a person of faith. Like I, um, I always encourage folks to uh, do that at the beginning, like show up faith forward and say, I'm here because of my faith. And that leads me to ask you this. Um, and the, the reasons there are, um, so there's a, kind of a range of strategies behind that. Sometimes you can do a bit of research and know uh, what faith tradition your decision maker is uh, coming from. Um, that is public information that uh, can be dug up, though it's not always as easy as I'd like for it to be found. Um, so you can connect with them around your shared faith and tradition. Uh, so an example of that is um, there's a, there were, uh, he's no longer in office, but a U.S. Congressman, um, Dave Reichert, um, who was in the Issaquah area, served there for a, a few terms. Um, he's a Lutheran and uh, I'm Lutheran. And so we connected around our Lutheran tradition. I remember the first time I met with him, I brought in some like kind of cheesy quote from Martin Luther and we just like had a good chuckle about it and connected <laughs> around it um, and that helped spark a, a relationship and um, you know he um, is a, a more of a moderate and actually ended up uh, being one of a handful of uh, Republicans who signed on 
um, in opposition to Arctic drilling. And Earth Ministry wrote to him about that and said, hey, we really do appreciate your leadership if you could um, protect our public lands and uh, sign on um, this letter. And then he did. So that's a, an example there. Um, if you know what tradition they're coming from. If you don't, if you're in more of a, a you know, a public hearing setting or writing a written comment, you'll notice all of Earth Ministries comment forms start with as a person of faith as well. Um, that um, again, kind of amplifies your voice in showing that you come from a community, that there are uh, likely other voters who think similarly to you in your congregation. And also uh, kind of pragmatically, people of faith tend to vote. So they know that, um, you, um, your opinion kind of matters in terms of keeping them in or out of office um, and put some uh, weight into thinking through that. And then on a kind of, um, um, I don't know, more of an esoteric level, maybe, I don't know. Um, but sharing that you're a person of faith like shows that you're there because your gut is telling you that it's right. Your values are what are bringing you to this space um, and the sense of moral obligation kind of adds a, a weight to the conversation uh, um, to show that it's really serious and matters. Um, and the values that you bring forward, so if you bring forward val values like safety and justice and um, uh, equity, um, you know, that will connect with folks even who aren't religious uh, in the crowd. Um, uh, because we all have, you know, our different values that guide how we walk through this world. Um, but if folks in the crowd do come from um, your shared tradition, um, and as we are a, uh, you know, a nation that's built on the Christian tradition, um, it does often resonate um, with decision makers. So, good question. Thank you. Thanks, Jessica. Okay, um, so I have, um, you have asked such great questions that I have more content than we have time. So here's what we're gonna do. Um, I'm gonna follow up with a fact sheet that will have details about um, what it looks like to really go in depth about preparing for a meeting with an elected official and um, what that meeting might look like. Um, so, um, I'm gonna give that to you in writing um, and you can spend some time with it. I think it, it covers it um, nicely. And then what I wanna talk about now is more about what it looks like to craft and share your story. Um, because since it's COVID times, um, we're not gonna be having these in-person meetings like we uh, have had in uh, the before times. Um, so that all looks a bit different anyways. Um, so let's, let's focus on our storytelling here for our last chunk of time together. And um, let me get my screen back. Okay. Um, just a fun picture here. Uh, so you can see Leanne outside the office of Alexandria uh, uh, Octavio Cortez, uh, AOC, um, who is a boss. Um, this is what you'll get in your handout. And here is what we're gonna look at. So when we're talking about um, how to share your story, um, what that looks like when you're uh, preparing uh, written testimony um, or comments. Uh, I like to break it down into three different sections. So the questions you need to answer are, who are you, what do you value, and what do you want? So under who are you, um, we're talking both uh, personally and uh, your communal identity. So personally, uh, you can, Always start with a person of faith, as we just said, and then pull out um, part of your identity that um, resonates with this topic. So it could be that you're uh, a grandparent or an aunt, or a, um, you love to fish or hike, um, or you're a doctor, um, or you um, have a chronic illness. Um, or uh, simply that you're a constituent. Um, 
a longtime resident of this district. Um, so pull out kind of one piece of who you are. And then also again, share your community. So share your congregation, your, um, you can share that you're a member of Earth Ministry if you're talking about an environmental issue that we're um, supporting, but show the, the broader community that is at your back. Then get specific about your values and connect those to a lived experience. So this is where you're gonna pull out a bit of story um, and um, you know connect uh, the values like Oh, justice and responsibility um, to, oh, okay, here's a good example. So today I was working with a guy on, on uh, testimony on toxics and he said, oh, well, I uh, used to be a teacher and I taught um, um, like in the humanities and taught about um, like global issues. Um, and so I said, okay, so you uh, perhaps were teaching your students um, and imparting values of how to look at uh, things holistically and think through um, what your responsibility is for those near and far um, in, in the many ways we're connected. And so with that, we can apply that to uh, this topic of um, chemical safety and saying that we need our agencies to look at the big picture here and take the strongest action possible. And that's our third piece. So um, saying what you want and and first kind of painting uh with your story painting the big picture of what you want so um you want a future that um with that where we live in a country that is welcoming to immigrants once again like our history has um uh formed us right um and in order to get there you might have a specific ask around um uh immigration policy reform. So uh, paint that vision, but then also be sure to tell them specifically exactly what you want them to do. Um, it doesn't help or it doesn't hurt to sandwich the your ask, your specific ask um, at the beginning and end. So um, say what you're there for um, when you show up, um, but then also end with it um, so that it's clear in their minds. Okay. So who are you, what do you value and what do you want is our basic framework there for you. Um, I can share some more um, detailed um, a, a worksheet that kind of walks through um, the different phases there around crafting your story and in more depth um, that we do sometimes when we, we do advocacy trainings that are on a specific issue and we'll kind of hone in on them. Um, so I'll share that resource with you as well. And I think we just have a couple more minutes here to wrap up. So are there any last uh, questions that you're holding? Yeah, Diane. Hi, I just wanted to say that um, when Jan talked about um, the work we do individually, that's such a strong part of the story mm -hmm. to say, you know, I have, a place for an asylum seeker in my home. And, and the fact that asylum seekers aren't able to come into the country right now is wrong. Right. So um, to, to, to use our individual um, work that we've done as mm -hmm. part of our story makes it much stronger. Yes, thank you so much for pointing that out. Yeah, that's like um, like when we were talking earlier about protests and, and saying, I have this experience of going and taking time off to stand in the streets with fellow citizens about this. Like, wow. Um, uh, so yes, definitely sharing those experiences, those stories. Um, that's, that's the, like if your your testimony is a sandwich, you know, that's the, the good veggie burger in the middle. Any other last questions? If you're doing this in written form, how long should it be? Yeah, I mean, you don't wanna write a treatise, um, but uh, 
you do have a bit more um, space in, in written form um, sometimes than, you know, in a, uh, a short, short meeting or um, in your, you know, public testimony that you, you give orally can usually only be two minutes. Uh, that's about one page. Um, and I think, you know, that's about um, uh, enough to convey uh, your story and your ask, um, I'd say like one page or shorter, um, because you, you want, uh, what you're advocating for to not get too buried, uh, in the words. Um, and, and if it presents kind of as a, a novel, um, then it might not, uh, get, get read sadly. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry, just one more thing that, do you suggest that when we give oral testimony, we should also have it written to hand in uh, to the clerk? Um, so you, you certainly can, but normally they have staff there that are like super pros at um, capturing, uh, at like dictating whatever the word is to, to write down what you're saying. Mm -hmm. um, if you don't get a chance to finish, if you get cut off, uh, then certainly um, give your written version to the clerk. Or if you're giving kind of an abridged version and you, you wanna say, hey, I my like full, full story as uh, I'm sending in writing. Um, yeah. Thanks. Mm -hmm. And I had a response to that as well. It's really frowned on if you read the testimony. So if you had a letter, you can hand the letter in and then have your own notes and speak from notes. But frequently I've seen legislators say, please don't read it. Yeah, it is a, a perk I've noticed of um, these online hearings. So now we're seeing more teleconferences, webinar style online hearings, and usually they don't have you turn on your camera at all. Um, so if you've, you know, practice reading through a few times beforehand, so it sounds somewhat natural, but you can read more directly off of a piece of paper than um, normally we encourage uh, when we're in person. Yeah, Pamela. I just wonder, um, I think some of my best experiences have been over time when um, new things evolve or new information about an issue evolves. And it's like, you know, oh, I could, I wonder if they ha even have this on their, on their issue list. Mm -hmm. And um, when there's a relationship, I think that um, it's, it's almost like, if you have an area of interest, you probably know more about it in some ways than some of the yeah. legislators. And, yeah. but pulling out something, a, a little pidget to, <laughs> you know, to, um, to share, uh, because we might within the heart know of what the next step is and they mm -hmm. are not even thinking about that yet. But if there's mm -hmm. data, that's helpful to that next step. Right. They they want to know about it because they become um, that they they get kudos for bringing that next step up and seeming right. informed. And so, yeah. um, I I think with some of those times when they're at their home office, when you can sit down with them, and and you think, oh wow. Um, that question might be important to you. Would you like some information on it? Or whom in your staff should I send this information right. to? Um, yeah. Has, I, I think makes me feel more engaged and it also gives an opportunity to move proactively rather than reactively to mm -hmm. a bill. Yeah, thank you. So that's, um, a good point that they aren't aware of all the issues moving all the time because there's so much um, mm -hmm. you know there's a and and that having relationships matter so just quickly there's a, a group from Whidbey Island that goes with me every year to the Capitol and we brought up a bill and did have that experience of a legislator saying oh my gosh I hadn't even heard of this one yet can you send me a fact sheet can you give me the bill number I'm going to look it up so yes um, it is 
uh, important to, to not go in with those assumptions, have some of the basic facts um, that you can direct them to. Um, but if they start asking you the, the wonky policy details, again, remember you're there as a person of faith and we can find the right policy folks to direct them to, to have those conversations, but we're ultimately there to, to share our values. Thank you. Yeah, and I, I think you, with Jessica. that, um, that's a good closing message, but I, I do wanna say that I'm happy to be a resource um, on this topic of advocacy moving forward. Um, I'm excited to, to follow along and hear how uh, Fauntleroy uh, decides to lean into uh, kind of putting this information, uh, bringing it to life and using it in your community. Um, and I'm happy to, um, like I said, continue to support that and, and be a resource on your journey. So uh, don't hesitate to be in touch. My email is jessica at earthministry. Dot org. And normally I'd give you a sign in sheet, but since there's no chat, I'm just going to uh, follow up um, with the organizers here Great. and we'll, we'll you follow up them. with you. I've copied those names down for you, Jessica. Thank you. Um, and I, I'm, I'm, I know Steve is going to close. I'm going to say very quickly um, thank you for bringing your wealth of information and experience to us. We, we realize there's a lot we can't do right now, but we could equip ourselves for the time when we can. And so thank you so much on behalf of the church. And, and Pam, thanks for joining us. I'm so glad you are a part of tonight. Um, and then my last thank you is to Bob and Diane on behalf of the Immigration Task Force for just crossing all the needs of our ministries tonight um, by inviting the whole church to be here, our representatives from the whole church. So, and with that, I'll let Stevie close us and, um, and we'll call it a wonderful night. Yeah. Yeah. And thank you again, Jessica. It's been so wonderful to have you here. Because we're sh running short on time, I'll say along with Jessica's resources, um, I'll be sending out a couple of links so you all can practice your advocacy through King County Equity Now and um, Families Belong Together, a couple different uh, uh, resources for you all to put this into action quickly. Um, but with that, I'd love to close this in prayer. So if you'd pray with me. God of peace and God of justice, you say in the Gospel of John that you are sending your spirit to us and that that spirit will be a paraclete, an advocate, um, and that that spirit will advocate for your good vision for the world among us. And so, God, I just pray that you would give us the spirit, um, the vision, the courage to move along with your spirit and advocating for your good vision for the world, for justice and for peace for all of those good things that, that you have set out for this world. Let us partner with you in those. God, I thank you for Jessica and the good news of hope um, and courage that she brings along with these tips for advocacy. I thank you for everyone here tonight, just willing to take their time out to be in this community, to see how we can move this good work forward. We're grateful. And is in your name we pray, amen. Mm -hmm. Thank you all for being here. It's so good to see you all. Good night, everybody. Thanks, good night. Jessica. So good to see you. Thank you, Jessica. Thank you. Thanks, Earth Ministry, for loaning her to, to us for the night. Yes. <laughs> good night.